So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this event, to the people who are here in person and to those who are joining online. Our event entitled Power and Money in Global Health, a conversation with Tim Schwab about his book, The Bill Gates Problem, Reckoning with the Myth of the Good Billionaire. Uh, my name is Alicia Ely Yeaman. I'm a lecturer on law here and senior fellow at the Petrie Flom Center, where I direct the Global Health and Rights Project. I also have an appointment and teach across the river on health and social justice and work in advocacy at the Global Health Justice Organization called Partners in Health. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the amazing team that has put this together. The Harvard Global Health Institute has hosted and organized this whole conversation. Carol Lucy's in the room. Carissa Novak is uh, moderating and, and organizing the Zoom, and she's really been just spectacular throughout the process. And also, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Petrie Flom Center and the Program on Law and Political Economy at Harvard Law School, as well as the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. Um, I, I want to open and sort of frame the discussion we are going to have with a quote from the former Archbishop of Recife in Brazil um, that I think speaks to many of the issues and dilemmas we are facing. Uh, Dom uh, Helder Camara. When I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. And of course, in this country, in earlier times, the super wealthy, the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and the Fricks were called robber barons. And the, in popular media, they were caricaturized and pilloried. And there was a feeling that these ultra wealthy individuals are rigging the rules of the game, that their wealth is built on the backs of the a uh, common man and woman and on the public dime. But that is very much not the case anymore with Bill Gates. Bill Gates is treated in global health as a saint and indeed a saint and a sage for his knowledge and expertise. Uh, and we're going to dig into a little of why that is and what the implications are. Now to anticipate some questions that may arise. We realize very much that Bill Gates is one person, that he is a product of a kind of dystopian reality that we all inhabit now over decades of neoliberal globalization that has left defunded health systems and, uh, and has led to um, extraordinary growth in private wealth while public wealth has uh, actually declined in many countries of the world, and uh, which has been accelerated greatly during the pandemic. According to latest data from Oxfam, the top 1% of the world own 43% of the world's wealth. Now, that wealth, that concentration of economic power, as we know in this country, distorts political agendas undermines the possibility of a meaningful democracy based on the idea of moral and political equals. Uh, but it also has an enormous impact on global governance. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. Um, it shows how the very wealthiest, including Gates, can create institutions, can set research agendas, and shape development in ways that were really unheard of just a few decades ago. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we're going to be discussing and what the effects have been on equity and accountability in global health. Before we get started with the conversation, I do want to make sure I get to some housekeeping notes that I have. This event is being streamed and recorded through Zoom. And the recording will be made available at the Harvard Global Health Institute YouTube in the coming days. We also have microphones. Uh, do both of these work? One microphone. If you have questions during the session, please go to the microphone to ask the question. 
I would reiterate, as per Harvard Law School practice, they are questions. They should end in a question mark. They shouldn't be long statements uh, or dissertations that you want to give. We also will be monitoring questions in the Q&A on Zoom. So if you have questions too, please send them in and they will be sent to me to ask Tim on stage. Um, and with that, I'm really delighted now to introduce Tim Schwab. Tim is an investigative journalist based in Washington, DC. His reporting on the Gates Foundation has appeared in The Nation, Columbia Journalism Review, The British Medical Journal, and other outlets. And he's been honored with an Izzy Award from Ithaca College and a Deadline Club Award from the Society of Professional Journalists. His reporting on Gates was also a finalist for a Mirror Award from Syracuse University. This book, which I highly recommend is his first book, The Bill Gates Problem Reckoning with the Myth of the Good Billionaire, was published by Henry Holt Books last November. It received an editor's choice recommendation from the New York Times. The Telegraph called it an extraordinary and detailed work of investigative journalism into an underexplored nexus of influence and, globe and power in global affairs. While the journal Nature described it as an excellent expose of hyper-billionaire myths that could yet help catalyze political murmurations toward more collective ends. The book is being widely translated and sold across the world. Now, Tim, the floor is yours. It's a great pleasure. Uh, thank you, Alicia, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you to Harvard for hosting me. <clears throat> it's a real honor and privilege to be speaking to you today. Um, so I do approach, uh, I did approach the Gates Foundation, this, this book, as, an, as a journalist. And I'm examining the Gates Foundation not as a charity or a philanthropy, but as a political organization. And why do we say it's a political organization? Because the area in which, the areas in which the Gates Foundation works, public health, public education, these are public policies that should be organized through an open, public, democratic process. Um, you know, we all have our own ideas about how to advance social pro progress, what solutions should be, how to inform public policy, how to change public policy, but we don't all have tens of billions of dollars in our bank account to make our voices heard, to buy a seat at the democratic decision-making table. Um, so to give a concrete example, the Gates Foundation in recent years has become the second largest funder of the World Health Organization which is part of the United Nations, which is ostensibly organized as a democratic organization. You have member states, you have votes. But then you also have private billionaires from Seattle who can come into the sidelines with billions of dollars in donations, which can shape what the WHO works on and what it doesn't work on. At the same time, the Gates Foundation can build a vast network of, of allies in its work by funding thousands of NGOs, um, universities, think tanks, the news media, governments, all of whom are also interfacing with the WHO and other political bodies to make decisions. Um, so, you know, and this isn't really a new criticism. It's, I think 15 years ago, the head of the, the director of malaria at the WHO, he released an internal memo which was leaked to the press where he was talking about the Gates Foundation's outsized influence over malaria and saying that Gates was funding so many researchers in malaria that it had locked them up in a cartel, is the way he described it. And it had potentially dangerous consequences on policymaking, the outsized influence of the Gates Foundation. Um, so, and you can play this scenario out again and again across many different forums and venues, and venues on the world stage. If you set up a Google News alert, you'll see that Bill Gates is flying all over the world on a very regular basis, meeting with heads of states. And when he does that, he's shaping prior government priorities and also government spending. Today, tens of billions of dollars, public funds, taxpayer funds, flow into the Gates Foundation's favorite charitable projects. Um, you know, the foundation also, you know, I think it's fair to say it's affecting the lives of billions of people around the globe. Forbes, for what it's worth, lists, you know, every year publishes a list of the 10 most powerful people in the world. Bill Gates is always on that list, and I think for good reason. So it's not really up for debate, I don't think, that the Gates Foundation is a structure of power, and that Bill Gates is a very powerful and influential person. So the question then is, how do we hold Gates accountable? Because in free and open democracies, that's what we do. We hold power accountable. Um, so the problem is, is that 
Bill Gates exercises power as a private philanthropist. No, he's not an elected leader. He's not an appointed government official. He's not a registered lobbyist filling out disclosure forms. He's a private billionaire who runs a private foundation. He's a private philanthropist. And there's very few checks and balances over private philanthropy in general, and certainly the Gates Foundation. It's an issue that Congress hasn't looked at in more than 50 years, and so we're right to re-examine this issue. Um, and what this really represents, then, is a stunning new form of undemocratic power by the super wealthy. Um, the light lobbying or light campaign contributions, philanthropy allows a man like Bill Gates to acquire great political influence and to remake the world according to his own narrow ideologies. So what are these ideologies that Bill Gates brings to the table? It's a pretty classic, classically neoliberal sensibility that he brings, this idea of market-based solutions, the primacy of the private sector, public-private partnerships, corporate power, the sanctity of patents, technology and innovation as a solution to all of our social problems. Um, and those ideas have been quite popular. They've had a great deal of political and cultural currency during most of the last two decades, which has really helped elevate and amplify Gates on the world stage. You know, he's thinking about problems and thinking about solutions in the same way that many corporations are and many rich governments are. Um, and, and this is true across the foundation's work that is often working in close partnership with other elite actors. But in recent years, we've come to rephrase and reassess these neoliberal values and sensibilities and whether they're really working. And it's also time to re-examine the Gates Foundation. We're now two decades into the foundation's philanthropic work. So what has the Gates Foundation accomplished? Um, you know, I'll talk, we'll talk today about global health, but it's worth noting that the Gates Foundation works on a dizzying array of other issues, um, and my book certainly covers those. In the Gates Foundation's work in public education today, here at home in the United States, the Gates Foundation, by its own admission, has, uh, has really failed to improve education. And their response to those failures is to say, is to say just because we haven't had more success doesn't mean we should stop trying. But then you have educators and scholars and activists who are saying, actually, that does mean you should stop trying. Because not only are you not having success, but you're causing a great deal of collateral damage. When you engage in these social engineering experiments to really try and change public education for poor American students, and it fails, there's a real cost to that. There's an opportunity cost. So at this point, you have independent scholars even suggesting that the Gates Foundation pay reparations for the damage it's caused. So we're moving the conversation way beyond the idea of philanthropy to talk about it's not enough to have good intentions. You have to have accountability, too. Um, in African agriculture today, the Gates Foundation has also failed in its agricultural development activities. It promised a revolution um, to cut hunger in half and to double yields. Independent scholarship shows it did not accomplish this. But more than that, Farmer groups across the African continent today are now explicitly calling on the Gates Foundation to end its charitable crusade because it's causing so much harm. So when your own intended beneficiaries are asking you to change directions or to stop helping, to me that's a pretty damning indictment and that's a reason to listen. But here again we have a question of accountability. Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation, they don't have to listen to their critics. They don't have to listen to their intended beneficiaries. If he insists, encouragingly insists on continuing to help these people, he can do so. So the through line between this work is this idea, this increasingly common criticism that the Gates Foundation is doing more harm than good. And it's a criticism that has also come to bear in the Gates Foundation's work in public health, or global health, which is, as I know it, means public health for poor people. Um, and, you know, the, the almost irresistible narrative we've been told, and that many of you may be thinking right now, is well, what's wrong with Bill Gates giving away all of his money? What's wrong with him pouring tens of billions of dollars into public health to buying vaccines and immunizing children? He's saving lives, right? And that is the, the sort of prevailing narrative about the Gates Foundation, but it's only telling one side of the story. Once again, you're not considering the collateral damage and the opportunity cost and the counterfactuals. So the good example of this was the, the pandemic, which was really in many ways the ultimate referendum on the Gates Foundation's model of, of governance or model of power, of what they could do. Um, it became clear very early on that we were going to get a vaccine and use a vaccine to solve the pandemic. And here was Bill Gates, 
who brought to the table decades of work with vaccines, both on the innovation side and research and development, but also on the distribution side and creating these complex procurement mechanisms organized with public-private partnerships. Bill Gates really was well positioned to take a very important role in the pandemic, and he did so. And his solution was to organize a massive public-private partnership um, to work with and through big pharmaceutical companies, to go around the world fundraising billions of dollars from governments, to create this big pool of funds and negotiate discounted prices of bulk vaccines. The Gates Foundation and its partners like Gavi promised that they would deliver vaccine equity. Their response effort instead presided over what became known as vaccine apartheid, as the poorest people went to the end of the line. And again, it's important to note there was there are many other alternatives on the table, most notably this idea of a people's vaccine, uh, this idea of instead of working with and through pharmaceutical companies, challenging the pharmaceutical companies, asking why we would allow them to have a monopoly control over this vaccine that everyone in the world needed. You know, why would we allow, in, in this moment of a major public health crisis, causing millions of deaths, trillions of dollars in damage to the global economy, why would we allow a handful of pharmaceutical companies to, to dictate who gets to produce it at what volume, at that price, and who gets to buy it? Why not open the why not open the floodgates? Why not allow every capable manufacturer in the world to get up to scale producing the vaccine? And there were, in fact, more than 100 nations petitioned the World Trade Organization asking them to waive patents over the vaccine. These are some of the same poor nations that Bill Gates claims to help and aims to help in his philanthropic work. So, you know, I think it's a pretty clear example of the Gates Foundation being on the wrong side of history. Again, I and I think many others see it as the ultimate referendum on what um, Gates can accomplish through his charitable method. And it's really a clarion call to think about new alternatives. Um, I mean, the, the other thing I'll say is this idea that the Gates Foundation is saving lives. Again, its work in the pandemic and many of the other projects, especially its, its largest projects in global health, Really, they function at the, with the benefit of a great deal of public funding and taxpayer funding. Tens of billions of dollars are going into these projects that the Gates Foundation organizes and helps run. And at a certain point, we have to think about, well, those tens of billions of dollars, there's a lot of ways that that money could save lives or improve lives. You know, we could be building clinics. We could be training doctors. We could be building roads, build roads to get people uh, able to get to those clinics. You know, just because Bill Gates has one idea, um, his own narrow ideas about the best use of this money, doesn't mean, doesn't mean that they really are the best or the right use of those funds. So I think that's one thing, important trigger for accountability, to think about, is this really a good and prudent and just use of our public funds? So to kind of wrap up here, you know, the book is called The Bill Gates Problem, and that begs the question, what's the Bill Gates solution? Um, the obvious solution is to think about regulating philanthropy, to bringing new rules, checks and balances, transparency to private foundation. And that's an important political goal that we should pursue. But I do think that it's limited. It's limited because to the extent that we're successful in constraining the Gates Foundation or holding it accountable, you know, what's to stop a private billionaire like Bill Gates from creating a separate outside organization organized as a limited liability company to do the exact same work? And indeed, if you look at what Bill and Melinda French Gates are doing today, they're not just doing their philanthropic work through the Gates Foundation. They each have many different outside adjacent organizations that are doing work that is indistinguishable from the Gates Foundation, but that operates outside of that, that, uh, that charter as a public foundation. So again, I think that's an important goal, but that's not a sufficient goal. To me, you know, I wrote this book about Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation, but it's really um, a case study for a bigger problem about extreme wealth. It's about what happens when we allow people to become this extremely wealthy. Bill Gates today has a private fortune of around $120 billion. He's also managing the $67 billion endowment of the Gates Foundation. When we allow people to become this wealthy, we know that they will use that money for political purposes. There are only so many mansions and jets someone like Bill Gates can buy. They will find ways to use that money for political influence. If not lobbying, if not campaign contributions, then as Bill Gates shows us through philanthropy. And as Alicia said, the rich are getting richer. So our Bill Gates problem is really something we need to address now and not later. 
Hundreds of other billionaires, including Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg, have already announced their intention to follow Bill Gates' footsteps. And why wouldn't they? You know, they have more money than they could possibly spend. You know, you can see the Bill Gates model is that he was how the reputational benefits to, to transform oneself from an embattled tech CEO into this humanitarian uh, philanthropist. Um, you get public applause, you get media attention, you get um, billions of dollars in personal tax benefits and tax breaks through philanthropy, and you also get undemocratic power. So, you know, like Bill Gates, I'm an impatient optimist. I believe that another world is possible, but it's not just going to happen. The, the world we have today, where you have giant tech companies that are super rich and maybe aren't paying, paying their fair share in taxes, and you have founders of these companies who are becoming extraordinarily wealthy, you know, those are political choices that we made, but we can also make different political choices. Um, and so it's great to be with you all here today to be discussing and debating this, this pressing issue. Thank you very much. So um, just to, to kick off the conversation, I want to go back and pick up on the issue of the pandemic that you raised, which is absolutely true. At the, in March of 2021, or there, in 2020, there were two options. One was a COVID technology access pool, and one was the Act A accelerator with the vaccine wing called COVAX. One would have incentivized voluntary uh, sharing of intellectual property and, and uh, technology transfer. The other one was basically a mechanism to pool fully made vaccines with the ability to have advanced market commitments. Bill Gates really put his finger on the balance to push us toward Act A Accelerator and the COVAX fund for the distribution of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, and that had, as Tim suggested, an enormous impact of entrenching inequity in vaccines. When South Africa and India proposed a TRIPS waiver under COVID, uh, Bill Gates again weighed in and said intellectual property is not the problem here. It's really that these countries in the global south just don't have the manufacturing capacity which of course advocates, I as partners in health was part of the People's Vaccine Alliance, we all knew that we had to deconcentrate manufacturing capacity as well as address intellectual property. But that is sort of the culminating episode in a long attachment, as it might be called ideological attachment to intellectual property. And maybe you could give us some more of the background to that and his own and the foundations. Yeah, and I would, go, I would go beyond ideology here. I would say this is really dogma, that Bill Gates really has this dogmatic belief in the sanctity of intellectual property and patents. And all of this, of course, tracks back to his first career at Microsoft. So we've either uh, forgotten or forgiven Bill Gates' first chapter where he was you know, the head of this giant tech company, one of the most storied monopolies the world has ever seen. And it was at the height, actually, of a public relations crisis as um, the Department of Justice challenged the monopoly power of Microsoft, that Bill Gates changed directions and announced he was going to give all of his money away in philanthropy. Now, we can imagine that there are two different Bill Gates. There is the cold-hearted, cutthroat capitalist who ran Microsoft, and then there's the kind-hearted, soft-spoken philanthropist who runs the Gates Foundation. But it's, it's a mythology. It's a fairy tale. He is exactly the same man. He is the same bully. He is the same monopolist. And he had the same dogmatic views about intellectual property and patents. You know, the, the pharmaceutical industry is not that different than the software industry in which Bill Gates, you know, made his great fortunes. And it's not at all surprising that he would use the political capital he has, his bully pulpit, and his money in his work with pharmaceuticals to dogmatically support intellectual property rights and patents. Not, not because it, in any way because he has a financial interest in it, although arguably he does have an indirect financial interest. But at this point, it's just dogma. Um, he's, it's just, um, you know, he's so certain that that's the right approach. You know, and one thing you said, Alicia, is that, you know, what Bill Gates said during the pandemic as there were more and more calls to leave the patent is that these poor nations didn't have the capacity to do so. Well, we know that wasn't true because many um, top tier news organizations were out uh, profiling all the spare capacity that we had to produce these vaccines. 
But what Gates also seemed to be saying was that these poor countries didn't have the sophistication to produce these vaccines. You know, in the first days of the pandemic, in the first year, Bill Gates got a lot of credit. People were even saying that he predicted the pandemic because in 2015, he gave a TED talk and he was warning about the, the dangers of a coming, potential dangers of a coming pandemic. But, you know, one of my sources inside the Gates Foundation, what they told me is that, you know, if Gates really had this foresight to know that a pandemic was coming, um, why didn't he prepare the world better? Why didn't he create the sophisticated manufacturing capacities these poor nations needed to produce their own vaccines to immunize their own populations? So I just think that it's, it is like a, a defining feature of Gates' philanthropic career, this, this, this fidelity, um, this dogged fidelity to intellectual property. And it's put him many times, I think, on the wrong side of history. You saw this with HIV AIDS crisis at the turn of the millennium, and you saw this with the pandemic. So, I mean, we're talking about global governance for health, and when we think about that, there are various aspects. There's setting research agendas, there's uh, defining the activities of multiple global health institutions, there's measuring the progress we're making, doing the research to understand different global health problems. And it strikes me that the Gates Foundation is sort of involved in all of these different areas of the global health ecosystem. And I'm wondering if you could give us a little bit more detail on how that is happening. Yeah, absolutely. And people who work in global health, maybe people who are here today or people who are listening in, if you work in global health, it's, it's very likely that you're funded by the Gates Foundation or you will be funded by the Gates Foundation going forward your institution is funded by the Gates Foundation. And um, I mean, the level of influence that it can have to really take over entire fields of research, um, to have great influence over policy, over how a, a, field, a certain field works on. I mean, it's not like the Gates Foundation is indiscriminately writing checks to talented people to you know, do what they do best. The Gates Foundation has its own ideas. It's, own solutions, its own agenda, its own priorities. And through philanthropy, it builds a network that can help amplify and elevate that agenda and those priorities and what it wants to do. But you know, you could look at, um, so there's a chapter in the book about the Gates Foundation's funding of science. I think it was $12 billion the Gates Foundation has donated to universities at that time, including Harvard. Um, the Gates Foundation has put hundreds of millions of dollars into journalism in the field in which I work. Um, so what this kind of comes down to is this idea of you know, the epistemic power that the Gates Foundation has to write its own narrative. Um, it can fund the research. It can fund the pilot project. It can fund the research and evaluation about that project. It's funding journalism that's going to report out to the world how the project went. And it's not to say that you know, he has a complete and absolute monopoly. It's absolutely not the case that there aren't many, many critics, including people who are publicly criticizing the Gates Foundation. But I do think it is, um, I mean, I guess I'll just, I, this would be a good place to bring this up, is academics have coined this term, the bill chill, to describe the chilling effect that researchers face in terms of publicly criticizing the Gates Foundation. Worried that they may lose future funding, you're afraid to bite the hand that feeds you. So as rich and robust as the critical discourse is and as it's growing around the Gates Foundation, there are still many people, and you'll see them in my book, people who are afraid to speak out publicly, to use their names, um, to criticize the Gates Foundation for fear of losing their funding. And I mean, as you noted, uh, Harvard is an actor in the global health ecosystem. Do you have any sense of how much money Gates gives to Harvard? <laughs> Anyone want to guess? <laughs> more than half a billion? Yes, more than half a billion. Um, last I checked, the Gates Foundation's grant records it was $611 million. And Harvard isn't the, the, the biggest university recipient. I think the University of Washington system gets closer to $2 billion. Johns Hopkins gets an awful lot of uh, money. Uh, but these are really large sums of money, even for an institution like Harvard, I'd say. Um, yeah, it, it's, I, it's difficult to know uh, the, really the details of this funding because there are serious transparency issues. You know, the Gates Foundation, it has an online grant database and that gives you some of the information, but that's not giving you 
all of the information or certainly all of the details. But $600 million is a lot of money any way you cut it. And part of that also goes to sort of the political economy of the way public health research is funded. I mean, there's people who are at the Harvard T.H. Chan School or the medical school depend on large donors who are willing to pay very high overhead rates to do their research because there's not the same level of public investment in uh, public health research. Um, so let's go back to the funding of journalists. That must have made writing this book hard, um, both, I mean, both because so many people are getting money from the Gates Foundation, it's hard to get people on the record, but also in terms of reaching out and getting coverage for the book. Um, yeah, one of the first articles I wrote about the Gates Foundation, I looked at every charitable grant it had ever given away, and I tracked all of the money was given to journalism. And at that time, in um, <coughs> mid-2020, the number was around, uh, a conservative estimate, a conservative analysis, was $250 million that the Gates Foundation has given to the, to the news media, to journalism. And uh, there are a few newsrooms today, certainly in the United States, that are untouched by Gates funding. Either they're, they're taking funding that previously took funding and they hope to in the future, or they have journalists on staff who are going and doing fellowships with the Gates Foundation or have outside employment um, through a Gates funded organization. Um, so, yeah, you know, to your question, yeah, my book lands in a media landscape larded with funding from the Gates Foundation. Does that affect how the book is received? Yeah, I think it does. Um, I mean, it's you know, it's, you know, I'm a debut author. I've still got dozens of reviews and media hits, so um, you know, people are paying attention to the book. Um, but I do think that, you know, as a general statement, that journalists have been one of the most important accomplices in um, in Gates elevating himself on the world stage, because so much of the news coverage you read about the Gates Foundation really just serves to normalize or legitimize what is really anti-democratic power. You know, these are stories about the big donations the Gates Foundation's giving away, its big audacious goals to change the world. Um, there's very little in the way of accountability report, looking back at what it said it would accomplish and what it actually accomplished, talking to critics and really elevating um, the really robust body of criticism that exists around the Gates Foundation. The good news is I think that the journalism is changing. Um, you know, in recent, Bill Gates has had some bad years. He had a public divorce from Melinda French Gates. There were allegations of misconduct toward female subordinates, which he denies. There was a hard to explain relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. There was the failed pandemic response. So I think that the world, um, you know, I think the world is opening up to the idea that Bill Gates is not the good billionaire, that he is a deeply, deeply flawed man with too much money. I think we're getting more and more purchase of that, and it's getting cultural currency. It's, it's, it's getting to be um, acceptable now to raise a critical lens to the Gates Foundation in a way it hasn't been for years, I think. So there have actually, as you noted already, there have been some critical books written about Gates and about philanthropic capitalism more broadly, the idea that capitalism can follow sort of for-profit, corporate uh, action, expect a return on investment. You know, if I give $3 for a vaccine, then the Global Vaccine Alliance will vaccinate one kid and you can determine what is cost effective and efficient in development. So Anna Manuel Byrne has written about this, David McCoy and Lindsay McGooey have written about this. The quote I opened the, the session with actually is uh, from their chapter. Um, uh, a number of other people have written about this. What does your background as an investigative journalist really bring to it that others sort of scholarly accounts have not? Um, I mean, in many ways, the work I'm doing is similar to um, the scholars that are doing this work, most of whom are in the social sciences, the anthropologists, geographers, sociologists. These are fields that the Gates Foundation doesn't fund, so they have a measure of independence about criticizing the Gates Foundation. And some of the scholars working in this field do a lot of what I do. They're interviewing people, they're cultivating sources, they're cold calling people, they're following the money, they're following paper trails. But generally speaking, I'd say what's different is maybe the audience is part of it. I'm really writing for a general lay audience, people who are not scholars, um, people who are not part of the academic discourse, um, 
So I guess that would be one difference. I mean, in, in journalism in the United States, what they teach you is your job is to afflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. And so if that is your mission, if that's what you're being taught, if that's the job of journalism, Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation should be among the most scrutinized, investigated people and institutions in the world, but they're not. So it's, I mean, the question could also just be asked is, you know, the different, rather than the difference between me and other scholars writing about this, but me and other journalists who are writing about the Gates Foundation, you could ask the question that way too. But again, I do think that's changing, so hopefully so the doors continue to open and we have an ever richer debate about this. So we have a bunch of questions online already, and I would encourage anybody in the audience who has a question to come to the microphone. Um, regarding the push to change privatized philanthropy to public services, how can we have faith in this shift toward a more equitable democracy if we can't have a say in where our tax money goes? Well, I think we do have a say in where our tax money goes. Um, you know, this is kind of the, the messy process of democracy. Um, actually, this is a good point to, to really explain in really bare bones, basic terms how the Gates Foundation works. Bill Gates has a $120 billion private fortune. He donates money, donates it to his private foundation with his name on it, where he's the chair, where he, he continues to control the money. So he's collecting billions of dollars in tax breaks in doing that and shifting money from his personal bank account to his private foundation's bank account. Has he really given the money away? Is this meet the common definition of charity? The Gates Foundation, then it donates money, much of its money, it then donates to other organizations that the Gates Foundation founds, that the Gates Foundation sits on the board of directors. Is this charity? Is this relinquishing control? Is this giving away money? Or is this, in, in some respects, simply funding yourself at every step of the way? So, you know, the way that, um, you know, the tax code works in the United States is we richly reward billionaires who become philanthropists. They avoid capital gains tax, they avoid estate tax. Tax scholars say that a super wealthy donor can avoid, every dollar they donate can avoid up to 74 cents in taxes. So yes, they are donating that 26 cents, but they're far less charitable and far less generous than they could or should be. We're essentially allowing Bill Gates to decide how his would-be tax dollars are spent on philanthropic projects, which are really political projects of his choice. So, I mean, we do have a way to, you know, this, this, is, this is the messy work of politics for the rest of us you know, who don't have this, this privilege or this entitlement to decide how our tax dollars are spent as philanthropists. You know, this is the, the messy, dirty work of democracy to really build political power, to change the way, to make our elected representatives accountable to the decisions they make about how our tax dollars are spent. What can be done to mitigate Gates's influence over the World Trade Organization, vaccinations, and intellectual property? Um, I am the wrong person to ask about that. Mm -hmm. I am, uh, I don't want to take a cheap shot at Bill Gates, but I am not <laughs> the cocksure guy who's going to say that I have a confident response to every single question. There are things I don't know, and this is one of them. Okay, well, I, I won't, I, I, no, I would try to answer that either. I, I think that uh, certainly there are strategies and strategizing in place to try to review what happened during the pandemic at the World Trade Organization and to push more control toward the World Health Organization. We'll see how that works out, but there are, there, there are many people discussing and working on this right now. Let's turn to a question from the audience. Yes, my name is Con Doyle. I'm with the Cambridge Institute. And I'm particularly interested in finding out, it's very hard to publish a book nowadays. And I'm very, very curious as to what uh, happened in your case and how you were able to actually get this book published without some blowback from the uh, medical community and the Bill Gates Foundation uh, with your efforts. So they, they usually don't like to have too many negative uh, books out there in the press. So I'd, I'd love to hear your, uh, how you managed to, to pull that off. And I say that, by the way, in that about 2,000 yards from here, Harvard was kind enough to accept about a $25 million donation from Bill Gates for one of our science buildings. And I, I hate to think of how much money probably goes to the Chang Institute each year from uh, the Gates Foundation. So they should at least be uh, 
commended for allowing you to come and talk to this audience. <laughs> well, thank you for the question. Um, I guess I would say, who said there hasn't been blowback? Um, so, I mean, there have been, um, you know, every book reviewer is entitled to their own opinion. Um, some book reviewers work for outlets with financial conflicts of interest related to Gates. Um, it, this is, my book did land in a media environment where um, the Gates Foundation is a, a very important source of funding. So, you know, it, yeah, I, I don't know. It's a lot of strange things that happened to me as a journalist writing about the Gates Foundation in this media environment. Maybe one day I can tell all of the stories, write a tell-all story. I don't know if anyone would want to read that. Um, but certainly, yeah, some strange things have happened with this book release in terms of the media coverage and some things that happened. Um, it's not that there has never been any blowback. Um, but I don't know. I mean, this is, this is the job, I guess, of, you know, as an investigative journalist. It, you know, this sounds high and mighty, but I really do think that you can't have a strong democracy without strong journalism without really challenging power and holding power to account. And that's really what I'm trying to do in this book. And I do think that there are enough people out there who recognize that and value that, that that really helps, um, that really immunizes my book from some of this blowback. And I just have one other question too, and that is, uh, in, in all the expenses that you had, do you have a large bill for lawyers in case they sue you for, I don't know, something uh, that you may have said in the book? I mean, there certainly were lawyers reviewing the book at various stages in various countries. I mean, the book was released in the UK, um, and so that has a different set of legal issues and libel laws there. So you had a different set of lawyers looking at the book there. Um, yes, there were, there were legal reviews. I mean, I did not have to bear those expenses, thankfully. So that's a publisher's job. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll take a question from online again. Um, we know that countries who are recipients of aid from the Gates Foundation almost often have limited infrastructure for regulation. What would be the mechanisms for regulating philanthropy and who would implement them? So regulating philanthropy. So that many of the countries in which the Gates uh, Foundation operates um, have limited capacity for regulating uh, so where would the regulation take place and how could it be done effectively to regulate the actions of philanthropies? Well, I guess I think of regulating philanthropy, regulating the Gates Foundation in the U.S. context because that's where it's incorporated. Um, it's Congress, the IRS is kind of the watchdog, but Congress really is the one who's positioned to change how the Gates Foundation operates. Um, in terms of, you know, like so-called poor nations and how they could regulate the Gates Foundation. I don't know if it's as much about regulating as much as it is just taking a, a political debate or a political decision about to what extent do we want our vaccine policy organized by a billionaire in Seattle? To what extent do we want our agricultural development project influenced by this billionaire in Seattle? I mean, these are questions not just that I'm asking, but many of the sources that I talk to and write in this book are asking. It is, is in what ways is philanthropy, if you are a poor nation in the so-called global south, in what ways is philanthropy really just creating a dependency? In what ways is this helping the country? In what ways is this dependency? And this gets to this larger issue of um, just decolonizing global health, which probably people in this room have heard of. Um, it's a really powerful social political movement that I think presents almost an existential crisis to the Gates Foundation, to the Gates Foundation's modus operandi. Um, you know, you had mentioned uh, David McCoy earlier, I think in 2009 in The Lancet, he published a study looking at following the money. And he found that though the Gates Foundation, you know, if you go to their website, it's pictures of black and brown people in poor nations, the vast majority of the Gates Foundation's money actually goes to rich nations. It goes to the United States, Switzerland, and UK, most of it goes to. Um, I think 90% of the Gates Foundation's charitable donations historically have gone to wealthy nations, not to poor nations. So this really gets at the idea of Gates's, um, I think, pretty dim political view that you know, the job is to help the rich, to help the poor. Um, so there's not a lot of, um, so David McCoy publishes in The Lancet in 2009, and I did my own follow-up for the book, and I found not much has changed. Again, 90% of the dollars the Gates Foundation is giving are going that way. But 
to the, to the point of the question, I think now we're at a point where sources that I'm talking to in poor nations are questioning this dependency. Maybe it's time to start saying no to the Gates Foundation's money and figure this out for ourselves. Um, so here's another question. Um, what evidence exists that the issues the Gates Foundation addresses would be closer to being solved without their funding and involvement? Well, I guess that's kind of difficult to prove, you know, a hypothetical counterfactual that doesn't exist. But, you know, I would just say generally, I think globally, we're having kind of a reappraisal of the neoliberal politics that the Gates Foundation brings to the table, that private actors and private billionaires and private companies are the solutions to problems. Um, I don't know, if I look around at the public sector, I see a great deal of potential and a great deal of success. You know, all the things, you know, just as one example, look at the United States, like the land-grant university system, where I went to school, the University of Illinois. You know, the public sector can and has done great things. I, and to me, I can look around and see myriad examples of how the public sector can really um, do good things. You know, it, it calls to mind something that you just said about decolonizing. Um, Shay Abimbola, who edits, is the editor of BMJ Global Health, talks about really the crux of the issue in global health, which affects other disciplines, but is particularly acute in global health, is this distance between those who would help and design solutions and those who are to be helped, those whose problems are to be managed. And that space, I think, is epitomized uh, quite acutely by the Gates Foundation approach to defining what problems we have and then proposing certain solutions over other solutions. Absolutely. Yes. Um, thanks so much, Tim. Uh, so I'm Sanjay Jolly, I run the Club of Democratable Economy. And um, so I'm not a public health researcher, um, but I have worked in civil society in other contexts that in a way that is very uh, um, philanthropy dependent. And so I want to ask you actually a little bit more concretely about the politics that you're suggesting, because, you know, I think there are, in, in various fields, such as my background in journalism, is that um, so many folks within civil society recognize the, the sort of difficulties of you know, the, the, the sort of hypocrisy and the contradictions of uh, big philanthropy. And yet, over the last 40 years, the state and state capacity has been so hollowed out that even when we think of, oh, well, if there was just a, you know, an injection of cash um, in the federal government or the state government, uh, and some sort of grant making program that actually the trust around state capacity that could actually uh, you know, that the sort of credibility of being able to dole out that money effectively with, with the sort of correct balance of expertise and democratic legitimacy is, is seriously a question because there's, it's just that the state has been so hollowed out in this respect. And what that sort of in turn leads to is, is I think even folks who are very critical of philanthropy um, don't necessarily consider themselves a constituency of a kind of transformation that you're suggesting. And so I want to ask about what is the sort of the political constituency for this? And, I mean, the only one that I can kind of think of is a kind of Bernie Sanders-esque left populist kind of eat the rich kind of politics. But is there is is that where this falls in, or is there uh, uh, sort of an alternative configuration of the politics that you're imagining? Yeah, I don't know the exact <laughs> configuration of, of how this kind of political change is going to happen, or the exact manifestation of it. Um, I don't know, I talked to somebody this morning about funding of journalism and how important philanthropy has been for funding journalism. And, you know, it was sort of, um, you know, this idea that, well, you know, billionaires exist in the here and now, we can't change that. They are funding journalism, we should try to make them more accountable. Um, and, you know, maybe there's room and space to do that. It's just my own view is that a, as a, you know, someone like the Gates Foundation should not be funding journalism because we have now, decades of experience to show that the Gates Foundation isn't funding journalism for the sake of journalists, to empower journalists because it believes in free and open democracy. It's funding journalists to amplify and elevate its own agenda. Um, so, you know, what, you know, I was in this conversation, they were saying, well, maybe we could make rules around best practices for philanthropy to make it um, more accountable, more responsive, more representative, and maybe that's a, that's a, that's a pathway forward. 
And maybe it is. I mean, it, it's worth noting that my original investigation into the Gates Foundation was funded by a foundation, the Alicia Patterson Foundation, which does one thing. It hands out a handful of fellowships every year to journalists to do good journalism. Um, so it's not that there's no place in society for philanthropy. It's that it's more that, you know, in my view, there's no place in society for billionaires. Um, and that, you know, that's really the kind of the, the real political question. And, you know, I don't know, I'm inspired, you know, you can see Democratic presidential primaries where candidates are being asked, should billionaires exist? You have all these social and political movements. You have Occupy Wall Street, you have Black Lives Matter, you have Decolonize Global Health. You have all these political and social movements. I do think that the world is turning in a way that goes against Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation, the model of power they represent. But yeah, to your question, I'm sorry, the exact configuration, I don't know that I'm gonna have a good answer to that. Uh, let's turn to, so this is quite a different view on philanthropists. One would argue there have been good philanthropists with major influence on global health and development in the past. For example, Rockefeller. That would be quite contested. <laughs> uh, are there any lessons on accountability from other philanthropists that can be applied here? Um, I guess this kind of like trails into the question we just answered. You know, maybe there are um, better and worse ways for, or certainly there are better and worse ways for philanthropists to engage. You know, um, should, um, you know, the people who the Gates Foundation serves, farmers in Africa, poor people around the world, should those people be closer to the decision-making power? Should they be on the board of the Gates Foundation instead of Bill Gates, instead of Linda French Gates, um, instead of the other people who are on the board of directors? Yeah, certainly there are um, ways to make philanthropy more accountable. I'm not sure that Rockefeller yeah, is the right example of it. Um, so I don't know who else you would look to in global health who's doing things right. Maybe you would have ideas on that. Um, not sure how to answer that question here. There are other questions from the room. Uh, okay, I'll go to one more from the ones online. Could you speak to the monopoly the Gates Foundation has on human capital? Many bright, capable public health graduates gravitate toward the Gates Foundation for a prospective career. What implications does that have on the global health workforce? Yeah, I think where you see this issue of a brain drain is especially in a lot of maybe poor nations where really talented, capable people ended up working for the Gates Foundation or adjacent organizations funded by the Gates Foundation. Somebody I interviewed in my reporting, um, she's from Sri Lanka, and she talked about she got a scholarship through the Gates Foundation to come study in the United States to study public health. But her point was, why do I need the generosity of a billionaire in Seattle to learn about public health, to go back to Sri Lanka, to help you know, people in my own country. And her other point was while she was here studying, she was, she's a young and healthy person, but she got access to the COVID vaccine. Well, her parents back in Sri Lanka were waited in line, but at the back of the line, beholden to this failing vaccine distribution program that Bill Gates, this guy in Seattle, was organizing. You know, where's the justice in that? And where's just the common sense in that model? Um, Great. Uh, yes. No, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm Jen Holtz with Emmett School of Public Health. So I'm super curious how the Gates Foundation has responded. I don't mean like have they barred you from their doors or anything, but they must recognize that there are flaws in their own model. Are they taking any steps to address some of the, the like the very clear power differentials you're describing? Do you have any insight into that? Not that they would necessarily invite you to the table, but maybe they would. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, before I published a, for my first article on the Gates Foundation or established myself as somebody who would put a critical lens on Gates, I could not get engagement with the Gates Foundation. I could not get interviews. I could not get basic questions answered. And I've talked to other researchers and investigators, journalists and scholars who have had a similar experience. So generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, the Gates Foundation isn't really eager to engage with critics, especially not in venues or forums that it doesn't have some influence that it can't partially control. So, um, I mean, to be sure, no, I mean, the Gates Foundation isn't inviting me to the table or cluing me into what they're thinking about my book. 
Um, they never responded, the Gates Foundation never responded to the book, which is not surprising. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that they really have a strong and clear reputation, the Gates Foundation, Foundation does, for not really engaging, thoughtfully engaging with critics or with criticism. You know, it's the same story I told where you have farmer organizations across the African continent petitioning the Gates Foundation, telling it to change directions or to stop this terrible crusade, and the Gates Foundation doubles down on its existing um, agricultural interventions and what it's doing. So um, I have never, I've looked at times, and maybe something's changed in the last year, but I don't think the Gates Foundation would ever, no, actually, they started giving grants for decolonizing global health. They did, I, I looked that word up in a grant database, and there was a couple outlets that were getting it. So they are starting to dip their toes in that area, and I don't think that's a good thing. Um, I think they should be, you know, the target of that investigation, not the, the sponsor or the underwriter of that work. Um, I just know, you know, a quote that somebody gave me from, they, Maya Angela has this quote that says, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them the first time. The point was that Bill Gates has shown us for decades exactly who he is. Do we really think that he's going to change? That a private foundation bearing his name over which he's the chair is going to really substantially change? Is the Gates Foundation, as long as it's headed by Bill Gates, is it really reasonable that it's going to reform, it's going to thoughtfully reform and change its ways? or? Is Bill Gates incorrigibly committed to his own hubris, his own belief that he really is the smartest guy in the room and a man born to lead and that he has the best ideas? I think if you look at history, that is the Gates model, is that he has the money, he believes he has the smarts, and now he has the charitable mission that he knows what is best for others. I don't doubt that Bill Gates is well-meaning in the sense that he really believes he's helping the world, but he's helping the world the only way he knows how, which is by taking control. And I don't see that, that I don't see the Gates Foundation changing as long as Bill Gates is in charge. I mean, I don't know. There are times and places where the Gates Foundation has certainly changed strategies. They're actually famous for almost impulsively changing strategies. But the kind of changes we're talking today, things about equity, equality, justice, I just don't know if they have the constitution to really thoughtfully, meaningfully go in that direction in the way that I think you're talking about, certainly the way that I'm thinking about it. What do you think? <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I worked in a partners in the healthy field system over a lot of years. We have a lot of colleagues who have had funding from Bill Gates. He was a comrade of Paul Farmers. You know, there's a lot of history of collaboration. And so the reframing is really like, you know, it's one of sort of looking from the other side of the mirror. It's not a shock, but it is, of like, okay, well, how do we reconcile this? Because it's not sort of simply a good guy, bad guy. There's a lot of money that can do a lot of good. It does feel like there have to be um, self-reflections on the part of these foundations. And it's funny, you know, that Rockefeller, it's a, that question was a funny question. But 100 years ago, the Rockefeller was a foundation was established sort of the same year the IRS was established, and the same year income taxes were established, or in that era, and that sort of, distrust model of philanthropy was of its time. So this is of its time, so what's of the next time? You know, what can we imagine that's better? Yeah. So, so I, I unfortunately think we have to wrap up, and I, I feel like I have to, working at Partners in Health, have to clarify that there is a big <laughs> space between Paul Farmer and Bill Gates. I wouldn't have called them colleagues. Paul Farmer knew everybody in the world. And Partners in Health does not take very much money from the Gates Foundation. The University of Global Health Equity takes some Gates money for specific things from Melinda Flange Gates. So uh, just I, I just want to really thank all of you for coming. Thank everybody who participated on Zoom. And I hope this is an opportunity. You know, we don't have that many chances to critically assess the role of the Gates Foundation and other multi-billionaires in global health or in any other sphere and how that shapes uh, the political economy of global health, but other spheres as well. And so I'm just really grateful for Tim for bringing his knowledge and his extensive investigations in the book here. And also, you know, maybe this will change our thinking and not 
treat the multi-billionaires as saints and sages, but more as policy failures and start to look into those multiple policy failures that every billionaire represents. Thank you very much again for